Hello, everyone. Welcome to our May, May meeting. Yeah. And uh, it's right after Trailblazer DX. And so we took this opportunity to do the recap of the great event and also bring in a presenter who actually presented in Trailblazer DX uh, to present to you in person, I mean, virtually, but live there to, to yeah to live in front of you so you, she can even answer your questions uh, on org strategy just to pep everyone up this saturday morning i'm playing this peppy tune with that peppy tune let's begin our meeting so welcome all uh, it's shiba from salesforce admin san ramon user group and we share knowledge and network uh, we meet monthly here to learn about Salesforce. And thank you all for joining this Saturday morning in the Bay Area. Uh, whether you are brand new to Salesforce, starting your career, mid-career, or skilling up for a new opportunity, we are your trail buddies. So please follow us on social media and stay tuned with all our updates. Uh, links will be posted. I've already posted them in the chat. And uh, we post our videos and share PDFs from presenters on YouTube and Trailblazer community. So to view all our previous videos, you can visit our YouTube channel. So this month, we took an opportunity to invite Alison Park, Principal Enterprise Architect at Salesforce from Chicago, Illinois. And she, is, uh, she was rad woman al alumni woman in tech and a Salesforce MVP. Welcome, Alison. So Thank you. yeah, Alison will walk us through org strategies and um, the benefits and drawbacks of a single org versus a multi-org. And so I'll hand it over. No, one second. Let me introduce myself quickly. Yeah, I am Shiba Tukral, co-founder kindcause.org. Work, I work at Jamf as senior Salesforce specialist. I've been the community group leader since 2020, January 2020 to be precise. And I did get an opportunity to present in Dreamforce 2021 and also have a session in Trail Blazers DX, the episode six, episode 18, which is the last episode. So do check that out. Uh, I have now nine certifications, nine times super, uh, nine super badges, four times ranger, and um, yeah, and we have over now five hundred members in San Ramon, California admin group. So welcome all, and now I just hand over to Allison to give us a brief introduction, and we are so excited to learn from her presentation. Take it over, Allison. I'll stop share. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. Give me just a moment. I'm going to start us off with a little bit of a um, with a uh, poll here, just to kind of get to understand kind of the um, who I, who I'm talking with today. Um, I wish we were, could all be in person. Because um, I do love uh, seeing everybody's face and, and uh, being able to talk with you all. So if you feel comfortable enough coming off camera, please do. Uh, I totally understand it's Saturday morning and maybe that's not something that's uh, easy for you. But I'd like to start off with this uh, poll. Um, we have a menti poll here just to get a sense of, uh, you know, your role. And I'll ask a couple more questions, just kind of warm us up here. Um, if you haven't used Menti, great, someone has, um, you just go to, uh, on your phone or your computer on another screen, go to menti.com and you're going to use the code 6091191 and you'll be able to participate in the poll. We'll all be able to see kind of like who all's on here. Um, I actually could even, ah, pretty easy to key in menti.com, I hope. So give everybody just a minute. Got a couple architects, a dev. Any admins out there? Oh, good, good. Someone's got to represent for the admins. 
Oh, excellent, excellent. I think just about all of us have, have answered here. So last call on that. So mostly admins, uh, as well as some devs and a couple architects as well. So that's fantastic. Thanks for, for playing along here. Um, we're just gonna go to, oh, we got quite a bit of admins, so good deal. Um, Want to get a sense of how, how many years you've been in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, as Shiva mentioned, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of beginners out there, maybe less than a year. Um, I'm in the plus five year too. So um, I'm hoping we have a few that are just very new to the community. There we go. Yeah, fantastic. Welcome. So we've got a really nice spread of experience here. So um, thank you for, for sharing. We'll go to one more question, then we'll, I'll get into my presentation. How many of you were able to attend Trailblazer DX? I know hopefully um, many of you were. Okay, great. Good, I'm glad to see people are watching it on Salesforce Plus. That's something that's still fairly new. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to really have that curated information. Um, Unfortunately, my session was not taped, so um, so you're going to see something that was only available live, which is great, and I'm glad that we are recording it. So, so we got a nice even spread. We've got some folks that uh, were there in person, so if I saw you, good to see you again. Um, Watch it on Trailblazer Plus, which is great. There's a lot of content. If you haven't checked out uh, Salesforce Plus, a lot of things, even if you were there in person, is a great way to, to catch some. And uh, sorry uh, that we missed some of you, but um, I'm glad you're here today and we can give you a little bit of a recap. So, okay, great. I'm gonna shift over to my presentation now and uh, just give you a slideshow here. So uh, my talk today is on single org or multi-org, which org strategy fits you best. And um, you know, do, if you feel like it, take a screen print. I will share out my Twitter and my, um, I also have my email here. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, so um, you know, feel free to connect. Just when we connect, just give me a little note so I know how you found me um, and uh, look forward to it. So like any Salesforce presentation, I'm gonna give you a forward looking statement. Uh, I don't expect to make anything forward looking, but just in case I like to cover it up. I am a Salesforce employee and Salesforce, we like to tell people that as a publicly traded company, we want you making your decisions about currently available product as opposed to anything I might mention that might be forward looking. All right, so, um, so I'm Allison Park. My position is a principal enterprise architect. Uh, I've been at Salesforce for a little over two years. Um, to give you a little bit of background on me, um, I started out actually as a customer. Um, I really, uh, I was actually an AS400 developer, and I was really amazed when we got Salesforce um, back in the early days uh, when we actually had a red S. Uh, it was that long ago, a little over 10 years ago, and uh, got on the platform and was just uh, really excited about what I could do. Um, being used to, you know, client server technology and, and even um, AS400 technology about what we could do on the Salesforce platform. And it's grown tremendously since then. So I really kind of drank that Salesforce Kool-Aid and became a consultant and a partner and now an employee. Um, as Shiva mentioned, uh, I've been a longtime member of the Salesforce community. Um, especially here in Chicago. Um, I'm the Rad Women Program Manager. I've graduated from two Rad Women sessions, if you're interested, um, especially for those of you who are in administration, um, who are women and would like to learn a little bit about coding. Uh, Rad Women is an awesome program, and I'll, I'll even give a plug for uh, the developers toward the end, uh, so you can share your development talents with Rad Women as well. Um, and I've been an administrator, a developer, and now an enterprise architect uh, at Salesforce. I wanna tell you a little bit more about enterprise architecture because uh, it's something that um, I didn't know how Salesforce did enterprise architect until, until actually I was recruited by Salesforce uh, to be an enterprise architect. 
And I really enjoy it because it really balances the business and the technical architecture, really bringing it back to the value. So um, at the beginning of the process, we really talk with our customers about um, understanding their business strategy, uh, mapping out that customer life cycle, and really understanding the capabilities um, that the business needs to have, not IT capabilities, but rather the business capabilities. And then uh, we wrap that up with certainly understanding the current state, understanding now the business architecture, we start to create a future state vision, and then a roadmap to get from where folks are currently from a technical perspective to, uh, to that future state and bringing that all together uh, with business value assessment. So we know, um, you know what kind of uh, return on investment can you expect to see over a period of time. And all this together is really the enterprise architecture methodology uh, that we use at Salesforce. And it's also why we have an offering about uh, single versus multi-org because uh, really you're gonna put business in the front of your decisions as far as how you're gonna go about this. Um, and I would like to cover just what is a Salesforce org so we all are on the same page. Um, why is org strategy so important? Uh, key considerations to be thinking about when you are considering an org strategy for your organization. Um, I'm gonna share the operating model and how that impacts how you look at org strategy. The top reasons why customers choose single or multi-org. So we're gonna look at some um, benefits and drawbacks to each type. And then um, very briefly, I'm gonna share with you multi-org integration patterns. So when you are in a multi-org um, environment, some best practices around what that in, um, integration can look like. And then where to go from here, we do have some resources at Salesforce to help you um, as you continue to, to determine your org strategy. And we are uh, live here, so please don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, I will keep an eye on the chat and uh, Shiva, please uh, call out if I'm missing a, a question in chat um, as I try and do two things <laughs> here. Um, so first off, what is a Salesforce org? A Salesforce org is the data and that custom metadata that makes up your uh, org. And we obviously have multiple organizations orgs on one multi-tenant core. Um, and we have lots of different multi-tenant cores, but it gives you a concept of that particular place that you log in to access your data and do your processes. That is one self-contained org. And that does include all the sandboxes that go with that one org. So each org is separate from each other. So when we start talking about multi-org, we're saying, hey, you're gonna have a separate login for each org. Um, so why is org strategy so important? So from a business perspective, um, businesses often want to achieve that customer 360 view um, so that they know when uh, marketing has uh, a certain journey that a customer is going on, that sales and service are in sync about what's happening with that customer so that when you come in and look at the customer, you can actually see what's going on. They also may want that ability to cross sell um, with other lines of business um, and report and analyze across those, extending those business processes so that one uh, line of business can work with and um, interact with another line of business. And then um, to ex really expand the tool footprint. So um, building on to one org, um, what your org strategy is, is going to really affect how you do that. And then things to consider about regionalization, uh, regional and localization requirements. So very often you will have, especially with global companies, a requirement for data residency, for example. And so you're gonna need to think about how you accomplish that. Um, if you have a single org, your org has to sit someplace in the world. So, um, you know, can you do that with a uh, single org strategy or where you're going to need multi-org to be able to put the data and have it reside in different areas of the world? And then from an information technology perspective, uh, internal customer satisfaction, what's that customer experience? And are they going to really feel like they can get to the data that they need and do the processes that they need? 
Are they gonna be moving between orgs? You know, what's that gonna feel like? Um, delivering on the strategic priorities as well as licensing implications. Um, if you have multiple orgs or you have a single org, how you license that is going to be impacted by your org strategy. Please stop me if you have questions. Okay, so when we start to actually get into how to make the call, some of those key considerations uh, are really overlapping. You wanna think about technical, you wanna think about how you're organized, and you wanna think about what is the business doing and where they wanna go. So those break down um, where you're starting to ask questions in each area, uh, considering organizational things, like how are you governing across all of these? What's that change management? What's the culture? Um, how mature are these orgs? Especially in a merger and acquisition, you may inherit an org that is you know, uh, 10 or 15 years old and you have a brand new org someplace else. So there's a lot more tech debt in that older one. So you've got to think about those kinds of things and kind of how that pushes you to or away from um, a single versus a multi uh, org strategy. And from a business, um, you know, how are you going to market uh, across those business units? Are they the same way of going to market? Um, do those processes interact and depend on each other? Um, do you need to share products and services? And what kind of um, standardization do you need versus how much autonomy can you give each of those business units? And then from a technical perspective, what are the org limits? You know, how many records can I have? How many custom fields can I have? Those kinds of limits uh, may impact your decision. Um, security and sharing model certainly comes up quite a bit. Uh, reporting and analytics, that's again, kind of tantamount to, uh, you know, being able to see the customer 360. So thinking about those things. Um, workflow rules, data classifications, administration, and uh, the ever-present release strategy. Multi-org is going to be com more complex because you're going to have to think about uh, that release strategy for more uh, organizations. So here is really, I think, the, the meat and potatoes of this whole thing is the operating model um, and how it impacts the org strategy. And it's a really good place for us to ground this whole talk. You know, I talked in the previous slide about all the considerations. Um, this is really uh, the key area that we look at. Um, it is based on a strategy, forget, uh, forget strategy, focus IT on your operating model by Jeannie Ross. Um, if you have the time, I highly recommend reading what she has to say. Um, she uh, worked at MIT and came up with this operating model for businesses. And we've applied it here to uh, Salesforce org strategies. So we're looking at on the left-hand side from low to high, what's that business process integration? In other words, if something happens in one part of the business, then does it get passed to another part of the business um, to act on it and work with the data? Um, or is that fairly low that they're, they're fairly uh, disparate? And then the same thing on business process standardizations from low to high. So if your business processes are highly uh, standardized, meaning everybody does the same thing in the same way, you're at the higher end versus if each area kind of has their own custom process and we're totally fine with that, then you're on the lower end. And what that tells us as we look at this kind of four quadrants is when we don't depend on each other for the process and the processes aren't standardized, then we're really at this diversification model where you can have multiple orgs that run completely separate from each other and each business unit has control of, over their own org. So this is usually where we see a lot of organizations starting. Whether they wanna stay that or, there or not is what they need to work through to really consider if that's where they wanna continue being. Um, if we start to move up on the process integration where um, they do impact, uh, one transaction will impact another business unit's transaction and they share customers or suppliers or product data, then we're probably more in a coordinated model where they are, uh, the data at least is pretty tightly um, shared between the multiple orgs and that's passed as that data 
is processed from org to org. Um, on the opposite um, kind of kitty corner, if you will, uh, is replication. And that's where each business unit really is standardized. They do things the same way, but they don't share customers. Um, they uh, have standard data definitions, but they don't need to um, you know, share data. Um, then we're looking at what we call a replication model. So there we are sharing functionality or metadata rather than sharing data. So if you have a global organization and you have data residency issues, but, and they have their own data, um, then you know, a replication model may make a lot of sense where you have a main org potentially that has that master functionality and then it's pushed out through some kind of DevOps tool um, to the other orgs. And then finally, there's unification where everybody uh, is in one org um, and they are globally integrated. So um, I want to be able to uh, have everybody in the same org because those business processes are highly standardized and they share those processes between all of them. They have um, uh, similar operations and those are overlapping and they are centrally managed, meaning that uh, a decision that's made affects all the business units uh, likely in the same way and the customization is managed within the same org. Any questions on this or any thoughts? I'm just looking in the chat to make sure that there's uh, no one asking a question. Okay, good. And feel free to stop me as we move forward. Okay, so, uh, oops, sorry, I skipped over that. Uh, and if we look at these enterprise operating models, I'm just gonna do a quick summary. So diversification, I always like to start there because it's a very kind of organic thing that happens. Um, you have multiple orgs, probably through mergers and acquisitions, that's what I see the most. And um, you don't have any need to consolidate them. Um, it's uh, more complicated than it's worth, basically, to try and bring them together. So you stay in, in diversification and that is very manageable because that fits your business model. Uh, coordination, you wanna still have as few orgs as possible because they do need to work together through process integration and likely an API-based uh, integration strategy, especially for the, the, um, for the data. And an effective service delivery strategy is required for governance. In other words, you really need to think about governance. I, actually, I can't overstate that enough. Governance is key for all of these. Diversification, it may not seem as much needed, but you can very easily get away with uh, having one org start to create tech debt or um, have issues. So governance is going to be key for all of these, but um, especially in a coordinated or a replicated model, that governance means that's going to make that multi-org strategy that much more manageable because you have clear operating rules for those orgs. So you have governance. What kind of new things do I move in? How do I change things? Um, that's going to be critical. And with replication, you can have those multiple orgs, but you really want to make them kind of carbon copies of each other from a metadata perspective. Um, so again, uh, we usually see a hub and spoke um, or federated model so that you have those managed packages um, or unmanaged packages that get pushed from a central team. Um, we tend toward managed packages because you don't necessarily want each org being able to change them around. Um, again, going back to that governance. And then unification, really as few orgs as possible and really ideally one. All right. So if you look at the examples of priorities and driving factors, this is just an example. This is just one organization. So they ranked in order what was most important to them with greater flexibility and autonomy being at the top and faster speed to market following closely and so on and so forth. So all of these uh, priorities are unique to an organization. And then they went back and they waited, okay, single versus multi-org. I'm going to have uh, greater flexibility and autonomy if I have a multi-org as opposed to a single org. So I wait um, 
the preference for single versus multi-org to favor the multi-org for this priority. Then when I stop, drop down to faster speed to market and pace of, of development and change, um, a single org is actually gonna do better for you for that priority. So I weight that single org a little bit more highly than the multi-org. And at the end of the day, after I go through all these priorities and I do this weighting, we weight them and we see we lean toward a single org versus a multi-org. And um, I can't stress enough that this is just simply an example because there's no one right way for all businesses. That's why we have an org strategy to determine what's right for your organization. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the top reasons why customers choose a single org. First is that single view, that ability to see across the one org and see all of the customer activity and the consolidated reporting. Um, the global forecasting, enable the global sales forecasting and, and pipeline management. So everybody is forecasting what they expect to happen in one org, and then that becomes a very um, visible model for everyone across the entire org. Upsell and cross-sell, I think, is probably the biggest reason that folks want to get to a single org. Um, in the case of mergers and acquisitions, very often, company, another company is purchased uh, because they have complementary products and services. So you want to get them into a single org so that then the existing sales team and the new sales team can sell those different products and work together um, on those products and services. And then certainly collaboration is easier in a single org. Standardizing the processes is much easier in a single org because they are locked together. And also you have that very nice um, you know, sandbox ability to promote things and keeping everybody on the same page. And then lastly, support. Uh, your admins only need to be, and developers and architects only need to be worrying about one org and everybody's focused on it. So it becomes uh, very easy, uh, much easier, I should say, uh, to focus on that one org as opposed to multiple orgs. So we've gone over some of the benefits, um, including uh, one thing I hadn't mentioned in the previous one is that single logon so that you can, um, you don't have users having to log in different places. Um, the overall management and the support and development is much simpler with a single org. Potential challenges, you may have a more complex org because everything is all in one org. Um, that time to market uh, may not be uh, what you need it to be because um, you have a big org and everybody's got to move together. Uh, greater potential that you'll hit governor limits. So um, if if you've been around a while, you probably have learned about governor limits um, and they are org uh, specific. So the uh, amount of processing speed or the amount of data, that's all, or custom fields is another thing, that's all driven by um, putting it all in one org. So you may have uh, less if you have a great, uh, more complex situation. And if you have multiple development teams in one org, um, there is a higher level of overhead and governance that you need to be thinking about so that that gets coordinated. So by the time a change gets to production, um, it's been integrated with all the other changes and you want to make sure that that's smooth. I think the key thing I want to point out when I'm going over benefits and potential challenges is that one size doesn't fit all. So figuring out your org strategy is never a like, oh, well, it's easy. You're just gonna do single org. There's also challenges that come with that. So when I work with customers, I'm very careful not to tell them this is what you should do because it's really got to be the customer making the decision for themselves about how they're going to meet the challenges. So do keep that in mind as you consider org strategy. So if we take a look at multi-org, um, you know, one of the things that is nice about multi-org is it's a lot more respectful when you have legacy um, situations that you've acquired all these businesses and they do things their way. Um, staying in multi-org allows that autonomy. So that's another way of dealing with that kind of legacy processes. 
Um, independent benefit units, if they are independent from each other, they may not need to be in the same org. So why give them that overhead and allow them to be multiple orgs? Uh, functionality. So sometimes, and there's a, that's actually a great uh, taped Dreamforce presentation from Dell, uh, where the enterprise architect goes over how they, they grew by acquisition. They had about 28 orgs, and she shared that they boiled it down into three orgs, basically one for selling, I believe one was for HR and one was for internal administration. So they did not need to share a whole lot of data and they were independent from each other. So they were able to, through functionality, say, we're gonna have multiple orgs, but we're really consolidating down our functionality. Uh, legal, so again, that data residency or um, tax laws or something like that, where you wanna have a true firewall between the business units, you can do that with a multi-org. So it may make a lot of sense from the legal requirements that you have, depending on what you're, what you're doing. And again, org limits, um, you're gonna have more limits if you have multiple orgs. And then lastly, uh, geographic or language. Uh, if things are significantly different um, across the globe, and uh, it may be easier to do that in a multi-org situation rather than trying to pack one org with the number of languages uh, that are required or currencies that are required. Okay, so here's the summary of a multi-org. Certainly it can reduce complexity because you have um, smaller orgs rather than pushing everything into one big org. Uh, you may have simpler security because of that. just that. Um, you may give uh, each business unit more freedom to innovate, and that may improve your time to market. Certainly you're gonna have lower data volumes because they're gonna be separated into multiple orgs, and that's gonna improve performance. Um, and overall, uh, simpler to manage the enhancements because you're not trying to push everything into one org. You can have your enhancements come up through each of the orgs. Some of that challenge though, is that may limit your collaboration across the business units. It may redu reduce uh, reporting functionality without integration. Um, one pattern I have seen when you have multiple orgs is to use something like Tableau so that uh, your reporting across all the orgs really comes out and is done in that like reporting layer, if you will. Um, solutions deployed to multiple orgs. So you're gonna have to push out, hey, I've got this piece of functionality. I wanna push it out to multiple orgs. That can be challenging because if one org has a different naming convention for a field or something like that, you're going to need to have governance to kind of manage that and figure out what the, the right way to go is. Um, you may have to duplicate your administration functions. So setting up users, you're going to have you know, that many more orgs to worry about. Uh, managing your security, doing all those administrative functions is going to be multiplied by the number of orgs. And if you don't have a single sign-on, um, it's going to be awkward for your users because if they have to log on to multiple orgs, they're going to have to do that um, one at a time and as they need it. So um, definitely, if you have multiple orgs and you have that situation, I encourage you to set up single sign-on. So I'm going to get into multi-org patterns uh, here. Um, this is just good things to follow if you're in a multi-org situation um, of different types of integration. You can certainly use point-to-point -point using something like Salesforce Connect uh, to integrate uh, two orgs to each other when you're passing data. Um, you can also use Heroku. Um, Heroku Connect allows you um, to not have that API overhead, which you would have with the other um, examples and you can consolidate it all into her Heroku database. So basically all of the orgs are pushing and pulling data from this main Heroku database. You can also use uh, you know, the pub sub integration um, with uh, some type of middleware so that it's basically um, event-based. And you can also do um, use MuleSoft as a great example of uh, integration uh, ETL and basically having a middleware uh, layer between each, each of the orgs. And keep checking the chat for questions. So please speak up if there are any. 
And then the other thing we talked a lot about data on the last side, this is if you have those replicated orgs, um, you're gonna need to share metadata and you're gonna need to share that with packages. And certainly that um, the good thing is you can use a DevOps tool um, to do that, but you do need to understand that DevOps tool and work it into your governance to make sure you manage that. And you're really gonna need to collaborate on that data model. Again, you're pushing packages between each other. You don't wanna just be pushing out fields. You wanna make sure that the receiving org is expecting those new fields and it works with their data model. So standardizing that is gonna be key. All right, so I'm already at next steps. Um, certainly uh, incorporate technical, organizational and business strategy factors into your multi-org um, or single org considerations. I think um, I would even lead this with business. I probably should change that, that I think the business needs to lead that because what you wanna do from a business is really gonna drive um, many of your decisions. And I think that's sometimes um, when we who are technical start thinking about this, we think about the technical pieces first and it's really more of a, a business strategy kind of first and foremost in consideration. And do understand the criteria that matter to you. I showed that one slide where the organization had prioritized what was most important to them and then went back and weighted single versus multi-org to try and kind of come up with a composite score. Um, so think about what are those things that matter most to your organization. Uh, ensure vision and future demands are thoroughly evaluated. So um, org, org merges, rationalization, um, putting things together uh, is not a, a minor process. Uh, in many cases, it's a major undertaking. So while you may be in diversification because you've acquired a new business that has their own Salesforce org, you need to work through uh, what I need to do to bring these two together. Are they going to go into one or the other or are we gonna start with a brand new org to get to unification? Um, those things need to be planned out and uh, managed very carefully. Uh, I have had customers say, uh, I got a new org and I just dumped you know, all those fields and everything in. And then I found out, oh, gee, I've got governor limits that I need to think about. So uh, this is not something to be done um, quickly or without really careful planning. And in fact, I often suggest uh, hiring a partner to help with it who has done this before because they will have a lot of standard processes that they go through that they think about because they've, they've, got, they've been there, done that and can make it a lot easier. So it's very much well worth that um, investment. The other thing is org splits or expansion. Um, the, the situation that I see for org splits is when a business is actually rolling one particular business unit off, meaning they're selling it and they need to think about, all right, we're all in one org, but this particular part of the business is going to, to be moving away. So that's actually creating a brand new org from scratch and using some kind of tool. I see, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. So definitely do your research, but org uh, own backup is one that I've seen where they basically you back up the whole org, you restore it. And then through the sandbox process, um, you slowly kind of build up that brand new org. And then it's ready when the sale is complete to be able to say, okay, you are in a separate org and um, allow them to move ahead. So both of those projects are projects, <laughs> is the point. Uh, so make sure you do your planning. Uh, if you are a premier customer, we do have uh, design a Salesforce org strategy accelerator that allows you to uh, kind of go through with a Salesforce um, uh, customer success person to figure out um, how to arrange your org strategy so you can get some help from that. And then you certainly can hire a program architect to help you with that when you have something uh, more complex, especially. So consider the cadence and trigger points for when your org strategy should be reviewed. This means this when you figure out your org strategy, business model changes can happen over time. Um, other considerations may come up and affect, hey, what worked for us 
um, you know, five years ago may not be working. So think about reconsidering that org strategy and documenting it so that you can continually assess is, is your org strategy what you need it to be to move forward as a business or organization. You know, certainly counts for nonprofits as well. So that is everything uh, for this. Um, everybody's been really quiet. So I, I hope, uh, hope this was helpful and interesting. Um, I promised I would put one last plug in there for Rad Women. Um, uh, Rad Women is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I am a two-time grad as well as work with the, the leadership team on workforce development. And um, love for you to learn more about uh, Rad Women whether you're a woman considering learning more about coding, um, or if you are a developer or um, have a desire to teach development, the curriculum is already planned and we welcome everyone uh, to be a coach. And the more coaches we have, the more folks we can get uh, into Rad Women and move forward. So thank you very much for your time. Um, Alison, I had a question regarding, it was yes. excellent presentation, very beautifully made and loved all the graphics and, uh, you know, made, made it lively and easy to digest material. Um, but um, for the rad women, I wanted to check um, if it's for men, it's for boy, men also, or is it just for women? It's just for women. Um, we have a bit of a gender gap, and I say a bit, it's probably an underestimation of women who are developers. So Rad Women was really founded to help bridge that gap. So very often what we see is folks who've been in administration, women who've been in administration, who uh, don't know anything about coding and um, have a difficult time finding a supportive uh, group to uh, learn coding in. And I recommend Rad Women to women who are administrators who haven't had exposure to development because even if you don't want to become a developer, understanding Apex code and how that works on the platform and when to code and when not to code are very critical skills for your career. Yes, I have, I'm a rad woman alumni. And Ooh. how many, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how many are, of us are, have done a rad woman course? Poonam, uh, can you speak up? Yeah, please open your mic. And uh, now is the time to network. Everybody, please, please feel free to open your mics and chat. Oh, hi. Hi, Shiba. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, hi, Poonam. Yeah, we can. Yeah, hi. Yeah, about that one, I would say uh, I, um, I did a session on, I think it was the first level of developer course. And all through 10 weeks, I really, really enjoyed. I think the coaches were really knowledgeable and they like they went above and beyond, actually. I would say to teachers, whenever I had questions, they were there to you know, answer that. Uh, really, truly enjoyed. And even all the you know, ladies or women who joined the session were absolutely like, you know, uh, it was a pleasure to work with them. So really very nice experience. Thank you. I know that we keep the sessions to about uh, 10 learners. So uh, one of the, um, we always have more learners than we have coaches. So that's why I, I bring this to attention. Um, you don't have to, you can be any gender to be a coach. Um, and like I mentioned, we have the curriculum already planned out. So uh, it's, it's pretty easy to be a coach um, because you're given the, that and you also will always have a co-coach. So if it's your first time, you'll probably be paired with a more experienced coach and that allows us to reach more learners. Thanks. Uh, anyone has any questions from Allison on a career, on mentorship? on how to become MVP, any question you have in <laughs> mind, please ask her. Yeah, you can open your mic and ask. Yeah, Alison had a question on the your presentation. First of all, a great presentation. So I said, okay, hey, let me listen to it before we ask questions on that one. Uh, I guess we were talking to you before too. 
So basically, it doesn't really make a difference as to the size of the business kind of thing, right? You say, okay, typically I would see multi-org is more for like, hey, multinational companies, like, okay, you're in Japan, China, all the stuff, you have to have multi-org for governance standpoint and the data standpoint and the kind of thing. So, uh, so basically, it does not, what I'm hearing from you is like, it has to be based on business strategy rather than the size of the thing, right? Yes, yeah, we, I didn't talk too much about the size, although I did talk about governor limits. So if that starts to, to be a weighting factor for the organization, which are really large companies or with really complex processes, um, you think are gonna be an issue, then you may want to consider multi-org, but really the business strategy should lead it. So um, I used as an example when we were a bit offline uh, that uh, using multi-org would work uh, from a functional perspective if you had like an HR team or uh, like net zero cloud, which tracks uh, sustainability and those kinds of metrics don't necessarily need to be shuffled in with your uh, customer data and that sort of thing. So from a functionality perspective, I can have multi-org. I may only have a handful of people in one org mm -hmm. and most everybody else is in the other org. So it just depends. And thinking through those things is, is really the, the most critical piece. Um, so there's not a, you know, oh, you, you could have just one user in a Salesforce org and that would be fine. Again, you're thinking about the licensing considerations. So if every single user has to log into that org, then you might change, it might change the dynamics and the math that kind of comes out when you look at it. Right. And I also like, maybe like, I guess that would be like a standard thing is like, from licensing side is your part, for example, there's a one admin, maybe let's say, as you have a company, the one admin is managing five orgs, multi orgs. Yep. He has to have five different user licenses, right? From all yep. the five licenses, that's one. Correct. And then he has to also remember, oh, by the way, I did the process in org one, and any of them, like you open the screen, you forget it, right? And the org are pretty similar to each other. Oh, did I make the change in org one or org two or org three? So I guess additional uh, complications for the admins. I guess I'm looking from the admin perspective, it also gets more challenging from their side too. You know, yes. what changes they're making, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, again, I'm gonna say governance uh, is really tracking the process so that everything is going through a sandbox process, is getting tested, is getting assessed. You should not be putting things right into production because you can even imagine, especially with multi-org, this becomes even harder, but certainly single org is the same thing. If you're putting something into uh, right into production and it doesn't go through that sandbox process, um, now you're going to have uh, differences with your sandbox. I think the only exception to that might be reporting, um, but anything else you should be putting through that sandbox process. So um, if you are an admin and you make a change to one org going through that sandbox process, you should have governance that tracks, okay, I made a change here. Now I need to either replicate that change or at least consider that change for other areas. So how will it like, uh, like just maybe from a, uh, like for example, you got org one with a sandbox, you make a change in org one. So the org, the sandbox is linked to org one. Can you also replicate the sandbox and talk to the org two directly? Uh, no, I don't think so, right? You can replicate No, you need, you need a tool to actually package that up and move that over. Right. Okay. That's what I was thinking. I said it's not straightforward and easy as kind of yes. thing. Yes. And you're moving it from sandbox to or, or uh, from sandbox to sandbox, and then going through a separate testing scenario. So my additional work, additional time, additional like challenges, and basically a time and cost and money and everything comes in from there too, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So those things, like you're just you know making the great the point is it's not a simple thing to say. Oh, we'll just add another organ. In this situation where I have a net zero cloud and I, you know, I've got that piece of functionality and I've got, you know, a, a sales and, and marketing and service org, um, I might not need to change, you know, share functionality. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it all depends on, you know, what, what we're talking about and what the situation is for the organization. Right. And I guess like one of the, you're talking about, like, typically I understand that also on the like acquisition side, you have multiple acquisitions happening. You're moving from multi to single org over a period of time. You move the data, you move the processes, whatever it is that happens in all the worlds. Now, you mentioned some cases like when you say moving from single to multi will be like, are you trying to sell a company? 
kind of thing potentially. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other cases that you might think of, like you? Uh, if if you do, I mean, let's say uh, I think that's one I've seen, just like in in the wild, so to speak. Um, there are probably other situations, like um, say you put net zero onto that org, and then you okay. decide, hey, I want to spin that off. Got so it. then you want to pick up everything you've got and move it into another sandbox and progress it through that and have it be in a separate org. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I haven't seen too many other situations where you, you'd want to, to slice it up. Usually when you uh, acquire a tool um, like a net zero you know, uh, cloud or something else, you're, you want to be thoughtful about where am I going to put it and how does that line up with my org strategy? Right. And on You'll the save yourself a headache. <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. And also the spin-off side you mentioned was like basically you would do is like copy the org into a new org and just remove that. Like not you don't copy the data, just the metadata and basically and remove the stuff that you do not need. And that certain business that you have and you basically from the old org you can delete that and in the new org you maintain it. Kind of like a very high level thought process around there. Uh, yes, and you still need uh, some kind of tool to move it. Mm -hmm. So there's not, you certainly can't do it with change sets or, you know, really yeah. easily. So, um, you know, thinking about that, whether you, uh, you know, restore only those areas from, from backup or whatever makes sense. Usually when you're spinning off a part of the business, there are very specific legal um, requirements you have of what you can put into something like that and what you can't and how you right. manage that. So you have to be very, very sensitive to what's required. And I guess you just mentioned on the tools in presentation on backup, what are the other tools, like a couple of tools that you'd like to evaluate it to make that change? Um, I, there are several out there. I would absolutely put a plug in for the app exchange to think okay. about those, those tools. Um, and it very much depends on the situation of what you're trying to slice, you know, slice off. Um, you might say, no, you know, I don't want to, you know, make a backup of that org. I am going to specifically make packages to move the functionality over and then use, um, you know, data loader IO or something like that to mm -hmm. move the data, whatever, whatever makes the most sense for the particular situation. Depends on how big an animal we're talking. Right. Now, if it's like a small animal too, like basically you can actually copy the whole data, like if you want, like I'm throwing it out there, copy the whole, back up it up. And like in a new org, I can upload the whole thing up. Then I can delete the stuff out there. And that's another, if it was a very small org, I'm just throwing it out. It's, it's doable, right? Potentially. Yeah. 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 Just be, be very careful when you do something like that and plan it out. Um, it might not work to copy everything because you don't even want to, even in a sandbox, introduce the information that you don't want out there. You want to be much more careful about it because sure, sure. Uh, they could end up being a competitor in some way. Mm, you know, sure. It depends. So um, you'll want to do careful planning to figure out the most efficient way. Again, I highly recommend a partner who's done it before rather mm. than DIYing it right, um, right, right. to help uh, with that process. They come with tools, very often have experience with it and can approach it with kind of, like I said, that that expertise that when it's once in a lifetime kind of org kind of thing, mm -hmm. you as the admin or the developer or even the architect may not have experience with that. So don't make your life harder than it needs to be. Get yeah. some good expertise to, to figure out the right the right path and the right process. Yeah, now, I was talking theoretical concept there. I know it's like Practical side is totally different than the theory side. Of correct, correct. <laughs> in theory, yeah, no, I, I get the opportunity to talk with customers who are in the middle of this process. And I would say from my experience, talking with customers in the real world, uh, it's, it's pretty easy for people to say, oh, no, no, this will be easy. And then they actually get into the actual doing of it and they have all these gotchas they're running into. So uh, I highly recommend planning through it before you've put one keystroke down mm -hmm. <laughs> and thinking about what are the tools I'm going to need, how much are those going to cost, the investment of time, so on and so forth. All right, thank you, Alison. I said, okay, yeah. hey, why not ask a question while you're there? <laughs> yeah, no, great question. Yeah. Anybody? Anyone else have questions? Oh, go ahead. No, I asked if anybody else had any questions. <laughs>
We there are a lot of people are from the admin side of things too. And I guess like, like maybe you can talk a little bit on the admin side, because typically what you're talking about, the org strategy is taken from the top side of the people. I say, hey, we should go from one org to multi-org or we should combine the org. From the admin perspective, what things they should maybe have a checklist or what they should be doing, <laughs> I don't know, to make their life easier to, so that uh, when they move on into either direction from multi to single or single to multi, right? The admin should be at the table when those discussions are being had um, so that you have complete expertise at whatever table is making the decision, governance, what have you, so that um, you have the right decisions being made and that the why behind all of it is being communicated. I think I see that from time to time when you think about the leaders of the business saying, this is how it should be. Uh, and then coming to the admin and say, okay, execute that. And gee, I wish I'd been in that conversation because what you're asking for is not as straightforward, but if I understood the why behind it, we probably could have found a much more palatable uh, mm -hmm. process to go forward. So um, admins, developers, architects for sure should have some kind of seat at that table. Usually governance helps accomplish that so that the business has an input into those decisions and the technical folks like the admins also do and come together and say, okay, to accomplish this ends, this is the process we're going to follow. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, another question while you're, you've nobody's asking a question, I said, let me ask another one. On the finance function, right? Because if you've got a multi org, so I'd say you mentioned multiple plans, like, okay, Heroku is there, like, like a data repository is there. And maybe if you want, like instead of HR org, I can have a finance org, which can have only the pull the data from Heroku and do the invoicing and all the stuff there. So basically from your experience, what is the best way? Should we like, if the multi org, do we have multiple finance function in each and every org? Like talk about licensing issues, all the finance team has to have multiple licenses there, I guess, or pull the data into something like Heroku or something like that, or pulled into a separate org as a finance org like you said, the HR org in the Dell example kind of thing. Or where do you see that as a best practices thing from your side? It very much depends on how you are using Salesforce. So if you are using it to do the billing um, yeah. and you've made that decision to set that up and you have multi-org, um, you know, I don't know that... Uh, given that information that I could say, you know, which, which way is the right way. Um, there are so many variables to be thinking about. Um, very often, finance folks are not logging into Salesforce to do the financial. Granted, if you have uh, finance functionality in Salesforce and you have tools in there that they need to use, that is, that is definitely a consideration. Um, I point out these org uh, patterns that mm -hmm. you're referring to with like Heroku or something like that um, right. as patterns. So thinking about what you have, how many multiple orgs do you have? Are we sharing data one way, mm -hmm. which I can, you know, it, it, you know, in a coordinated way, I work on it with this team and then I push the data over to continue having it for the record for say the finance folks. And if I can keep it the simpler I can keep it, the better. Mm -hmm. But simple doesn't always get the job done. Right. So we have other patterns depending on the amount of data, the amount of pushing and pulling, mm -hmm. um, the, the way that makes sense. Um, if I have MuleSoft, now I've got another, you know, kind of tool in my quiver that I can maybe potentially use. Mm -hmm. So the patterns are simply uh, there to help inform but when you get into the detail of like, what's the best one? Um, there isn't a best one. It's the best one that matches the particulars of that job that needs to be right. done. All right. Does that, I, I know I kind of didn't answer your question, but. No, no, I just I, like, uh, yeah, like I, I know I just like, I know it's like every use case is so different at a very high level. I'm just trying to understand exactly because like, I'm also looking from, not from the licensing issues and more from the, headache issues still like, okay, we've got 10 orgs, for example, and it's too many kind of thing, but 10 orgs, if I have to have finance team of five, I've got additional people have to log in in multiple orgs to see the data and all the stuff. So kind of thing. So anyway. Yep. Yep. So definitely if you have multiple orgs and people have to log in between them, set up some kind of single sign-on. Mm -hmm. 
right. so okay. that they can come in and they don't have to change passwords in five words or something like that. Yeah, I guess I guess right. like I'll let other people ask a question on how to become the. I guess one thing people like hear all the time is how do you become an MVP? And, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. No. I. I. I always laugh when I hear that question because mm -hmm. I I know from my own experience and from other experience that if you want to be an MVP, um, you know certainly it's wonderful. Be involved in the community, contribute to the community, um, you know, be in that community. But don't do it because you want to be an MVP. Do it because you enjoy the work. And MVP is a nice, um, you know notice or award for the work that you're doing. And if you're disappointed because you're in the community doing work and you haven't gotten MVP, uh, don't be. Hopefully the reward is being in the community. I will, I will tell you, I have uh, seen it where folks have been in the community, they really want to be an MVP, and then they, they don't get it, uh, and they keep working in the community, and then they forget about trying to become an MVP. That's usually when they become an MVP. <laughs> oh, usually life works, right? When you're chasing something, you don't get it. When you don't chase it, it comes to you. <laughs> because then you're starting to really focus. I, I think the reason is you're really focusing on the work and you're really putting your, your whole heart into it for the joy of the work. Right. So, uh, so that's why I encourage people to get involved in the community however you want. And any of the kudos and opportunities that come, golden hoodie included, um, you know, that's uh, that's just a cherry on top. And it's ideally there to help um, help you to influence and do again. more. So uh, so yeah, I, I I loved being an MVP, uh, but had to give it up when I became an employee. <laughs> oh, okay. So only for the external people only, not the employees, right? Anymore. Correct. Correct. Okay. So I am no longer an MVP. Uh, but certainly just as involved in the community because that's something I just uh, love doing. Yeah, interesting. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Excellent. So if this way, let's take an opportunity to have a quick photograph of everyone. Um, it's Alison, if you can stop the share. And oh, absolutely. If you can just um, for a few seconds open your camera so we can just take a quick shot of uh, a lot of uh, people are laughing. Kind of thing, yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, can we just have a, like a quick shot with uh, some sign, maybe victory or heart? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What's a popular one? Okay, Allison says heart. So let's. I, I like I like the heart. The yeah. heart is like this difficult is okay to make. Though. Yeah, heart is difficult to make. Kind of thing. That's all the things. So. Right. Yes, and we can put it to one and... side too. <laughs> Can you, uh, everybody, can you open the camera for a few seconds with the heart? Uh, for peace, care. if that's easier. Yeah, okay, that's perfect. Good. Thank you. Some more people opening up. Right, I'll just, thanks, John. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so I'll just take a quick snip for us. You can do victory sign, Shiva. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with one hand, that's what you can do, right? One more. I can look this sound easy. <laughs> yeah, good, good thinking. The problem with the heart is like it's difficult to get the whole the real heart sign kind of thing. <laughs> Victory sign is okay. You can't go wrong with that. You done? Shiva? done. Yeah, done. Thank you. I guess Puna so, had a question. Uh, Puna had a she raised her hand. I don't know. Puna she had a question. Okay. Maybe not. No, I yeah, I do not have. Maybe accidentally I did that. Uh, no worries. Okay, okay. Uh, let me share screen uh, to go to the next segment because looks like we are reducing the audience. So we'll just quickly do the next. Maybe people have a busy Mother's Day weekend. <laughs> so um, yeah, happy Mother's Day to everyone. Um, hope you enjoy it fully and you are pampered. Uh, and you can pamper your moms and um, yeah, have a very joyous Mother's Day weekend and uh, say happy Cinco de Mayo to all those people who are celebrating that. So margaritas and tacos and whatnot, right? <laughs> <laughs>
So yeah. Uh, next, that's my segment. So we just had a little fireside chat. I'm going to share my screen for the Trailblazer DX um, recap. Uh, as you see the plushies here, they're from Trailblazer DX. Um, Mealsoft, Cody, Salesforce, right? And Slack and Tableau. So basically a lot of um, announcements on integrating these four platforms, um, bringing together the four, four platforms. And um, yeah, so MuleSoft, Tableau, Slack, and Salesforce. And um, you likely know that these three of these are the result of high value acquisitions. And TDX updates that um, will focus on how Salesforce have worked to unify each of the developer experiences and leverage flow automation across all these pillars, which is being touted as new era of automation. So just to share this recording, by Chris Lunt. And all of that learning, all of the achievements, all of your connections, they all come together on your trailblazer.me profile, your trusted Salesforce resume. And we have some new things coming to the trailblazer.me profile. We are announcing new Ranger ranks. You're gonna see these, shut the front door. <laughs> These are amazing. Do we have any rangers here in the house? I, we got a lot of rangers here. You all are going to love this. We're also, we're also announcing brand new community tags and ecosystem certifications. So y'all want to see this in action, right? Yeah. Marciana, you want to see this? I know you do. <laughs> all right, so Stefan, Renan, want to do one more demo? All right. So let's see all of this in action through the viewpoint of Miguel Martinez, an amazing trailblazer. Yes, give it up for Miguel. <laughs> so Miguel is a MuleSoft trailblazer, and the trailblazer.me profile is super relevant for his unique skills and his unique expertise, because it showcases all of his learning. And Miguel is not only certified in Salesforce, he's also certified in MuleSoft in Slack, in Tableau, and all of this comes together on the profile. Miguel, you've been keeping very busy. <laughs> and now that you have all of these learnings, all these certifications coming together, you can showcase that to employers and to other community members to show your achievements. Now, speaking of communities, we have a new section here on the trailblazer.me profile, community tags. So whether you are an awesome admin, or you're part of the data fam, or like Miguel, a proud muley and an all-star architect, you'll be able to showcase your community tags right on your profile so you can see who you're on the same path with. Oh, are you not able to hear anything? You're able to hear. Oh, Poonam, uh, looks like something at your end. Others are able to hear. And I think I saved my favorite feature for last year. So let's look here at Miguel. He's been keeping pretty busy, 199 badges and almost 100,000 points. He's hit Ranger, and he has kept going. But I, yes, congratulations. And I mentioned a little thing called Ranger ranks. So coming soon, when you hit that 200th badge, you're going to be a double star Ranger. Because we've, we've heard you, you want to showcase the breadth of your achievements through your Ranger rank. So you can climb the ranks from Ranger to Double Star Ranger all the way to All Star Ranger on Trailhead. And that is how the Trailblazer.me profile pulls So as you saw, um, they have changed. So it's not yet there, but it's gonna be changing, Oops, sorry. Uh, the, our Trailblazer Me profile to include all those certifications from MuleSoft, Slack, and Tableau. So that's how, and also, uh, I think I 
didn't mention, but there is this, yeah, there's a quest uh, that I'll just give you the link to. So this is just the same thing that it, it, it will be your trailblazer me, we will become your trusted resume for the Salesforce ecosystem. The enhanced profile will enable us to showcase our Salesforce credentials um, also across MuleSoft, Tableau, and Slack. So that's something that was announced during Trailblazer DX. Then um, Salesforce Flow integrated Slack, MuleSoft, Tableau, and robotic process automation. So basically, this Flow innovations were in unveiled at Trailblazer DX, themed as the year of the developer, the Cody is from represented the developer event. And Salesforce recognizes that flow will play a huge part in empowering low, low code individuals. So, and there are impressive numbers to date. So Salesforce powers 1 trillion plus automations every month. And that approximates to 44 million every day. The business value is estimated at $2 per trillion. So, there's going to be flow orchestrator, flow in Slack, flow actions for Tableau, flow integrations, MuleSoft and flow, and then flow robotic process automation. So flow is the future of automation. And I will put this link in the chat, which is the quest link. Um, this is a quest link if you pass this, uh, if you um, attempt this, you will get some swag, etc. So try doing that. Um, I'll just post the link in the chat. And um, next up was oops, the Salesforce DevOps Center in the long term DevOps Center won't be just an alternative to change sets. That's because DevOps itself is such an enormous improvement on old workflows using change sets. So DevOps Center was featured in many sessions across TDX and the public beta has been confirmed for June. So look forward to the Salesforce DevOps Center. And, and then, um, this is just MuleSoft Anypoint Code Builder. Code Builder is coming up and Universal API Management. And um, Tableau Embedded Analytics. So developers will be empowered to take the data visualizations to new horizons, thanks to the new tools for embedding Tableau analytical experiences into their own products and applications. Tableau wants to unleash the creativity of developers to connect to any and all data. The Web Data Connector 3.0 is a toolkit that comprises reusable libraries to build new connectors. And finally, Tableau will be integrated with Salesforce Flow to close the loop between insight and action. With Salesforce Flow driving automation from Tableau Insights, it's a huge leap to unify two products. And just for information, we have in our YouTube channel, uh, Tableau series. Um, which covers data as well as um, the dashboard sections. So do look that up if you can, it will help with learning Tableau. And this is now summer 22. They also had a session on migrate um, workflow to workflow rules to flows, which I attended and found it very impressive. It showed the light timeline when a workflow is going to be retiring. Um, and uh, then the new new thing in summer 22, which is now generally available, is that flow has includes formula and it includes is new, prior value is changed. And you can use these anywhere in the flow and is not null also. So they were emphasizing on how to build formulas uh, in our start entry criteria. So, Basically, here in the start entry criteria, you can um, you can create a formula and make it make your entry criteria really granular and specific. So they were emphasizing on that, and then formula builder checks syntax uh, similar to formula 
field builder of the object manager. So if we are sloppy in your work, you will get that red uh, error message that will ask you to check your in syntax via the button. So it's no longer when you save the flow, but it's right when you are building the formula that you will find the error. That's a big clap and big enhancement that everybody was looking forward to. And they also mentioned that the best practice is not to have like one flow per object, but you can have multiple flows per object, but you can use like different types, like fast field updates, um, use two flows if you mix in actions and related records as well. So you can be as specific as possible in the entry criteria. So you don't have to run the flow every time, you can just run it when it's required. So only, they run only when the entry criteria are met. And this is what is different from process builder. So you can, you, they ask you to combine multiple updates and actions into one single flow. And so that was um, also another very interesting thing is uh, starting summer 22, there a uh, flow trigger export explorer supports manual reordering of triggered flows. So you can create a new flow right from this dialog box, as you know from here, new flow. And then the action will pre-fill with the, the start element for you. The orchestrations are supported. Uh, when you open flow details and versions, like here in the flow trigger explorer, you, you get all these different flow versions and you can create new flow right from here. And then um, on the, this is on the right side panel, and you can e open each version and via this link here and activate the version you want on the side panel. So this is functionality is much better than alternative than any other existing option. And then they, another new thing that they started was um, low code flow testing comes to life. On your flow campus, uh, on your flow canvas, you will see view tests right here in the view test button on the upper right side. And then you will have to agree to the terms and then you can click on it because the functionality is in the beta as of summer 22. And then you can create and start building your test. So this is also elaborated in Salesforce Ben. Uh, so you can just go and check out this um, article, seven foundational skills before learning Salesforce flow from Salesforce Ben. So, and also this, I saw this new functionality, customize and filter related lists in Lightning App Builder. So we have we we are we know that there are dynamic forms, there is dynamic actions, there are dynamic interactions, and now there is dynamic related lists. So the dynamic related lists added add a new component to lightning pages. If you, you see in this on the uh, left hand column column you will see dynamic related list listed here and um, dynamic related list single and the uh, dynamic related list basically give you the ability to create custom related lists that can be filtered to display only when a certain criteria is met so in the v uh, there is a video in salesforce ben which shows that when you can create two related uh, lists on account page, one showing open opportunities, other showing closed opportunities, and you can configure what fields are displayed and in what order, and you can choose number of records to display and also select which actions are available for that. So that was the recap for Trailblazer DX. Um, they were main announcements that were made in true to the core session, which was very interesting session uh, where, you know, the product owners and we and Parker Harris and all the executives were there and they are asked to answer questions by the Ohana. People ask questions and they have to answer right there. So one announcement that was made was that Salesforce Classic may get deprecation announcement starting next year with a long timeline before it is cut off. So it's not, it's gonna be a long timeline, but 
they will start the deprecation announcement starting next year. And then the same for, uh, they, support, they are gonna support both Slack and Chatter for the time being as per true to the core, but the future is Slack. So they don't want to cut off things. They want to go give us a long timeline before we just cut off because so many people have automation spilled on these. And also, as I just talked about the unit tests using flow, so you can write automated unit tests using flow. You uh, convert to test button on flow that opens up assertions. And then code builder was announced in 2020, and um, but it is coming up this, um, soon. Like so, and Dev console console is will be around for a long while still. And then they announced new certifications, Salesforce Business Analyst and Strategy Designer, Strategy Designer certifications. So those two certifications were announced. Also, in the we had like a day zero where we I had an opportunity to go to Salesforce Tower. And this sheet shows some interesting fa uh, facts about um about salesforce tower so the first, top three ones that i really enjoyed seeing was that salesforce tower is the tallest office building west of chicago a total of 61 floors and then do you know that there are life plants on floors 60 and 61 including 128 different species and then they have seven point eight million gallons of water that will be saved yearly through the on-site backwater recycling system. So the tower is as tall as 3.5 statues of liberty stack on top of each other. So these are some of the interesting facts from Salesforce Tower that I had a great opportunity to uh, check out on day zero. Right, so this was all the recap. These are the new plushies from there. This is Mule representing MuleSoft, Slack, and Cody. So that was all for the recap. Please ask questions or network in chat. I see some comments here. Uh, New to Salesforce, uh, SJ, who's that? Please open your mic and talk. Yeah. Oh, my, I'm Shri, Shri Devi Jagannath. Oh, hi, hi, Shri Devi. Hi. Hi, hi. Yeah, I'm new to Salesforce. I'm just uh, taking training and planning to get the certification. Uh, so I would like to know if how I can get started uh, from expert like you guys. <laughs> Yeah, so I used certification days to learn. Sure. Um, there are, of course, trail mixes. I completed my business specialist. That was my first super batch I completed before taking that certification. Uh, it was very helpful. If you can join some study groups or boot camps, those are really helpful. And um, as I would suggest as a call that um, for my admin certification, I we actually had a group of ladies and we were studied together. And um, basically everything like this practice questions, you see those questions and you um, check out in the platform, replicate those scenarios in the platform and try to connect how platform looks like, how each feature there is, how it's present in the platform. It's super helpful to connect um, when the questions are asked there and easy to answer and those questions. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Apuna, right. if you want to add some points if I've missed anything to do, do, do that. If anyone, Amma, Amma is welcome. Um, um, yeah, I think you have mentioned everything, Shiva. On top of that, I think I went through study guide. I printed that out and went through each section. Uh, and if I don't understand any particular topic, 
I used to watch a lot of YouTube videos that help a lot. Um, I think I used a Udemy course as well by Mike Miller. Yeah, other than that, I think you covered everything. Yes, my, I agree to the points that um, Poonam just raised, the very va valuable point. Study guides is the first point where you see all the syllabus, basically. And so syllabus has been evolving, actually. So definitely look that up. And the other thing is um, Mike Wheeler has awesome course and he gives actual scenarios and walks you through that. And uh, yeah, definitely those are all great pointers. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you uh, so much. You're welcome. Hi, hi, if I may add as well. Hi, I'm Praveena here. I'm new to the ecosystem. I recently got my certification in Salesforce administration and looking out for like opportunities as a business analyst or you know Salesforce admin but uh since I'm just so fresh in my head uh I actually follow focus on posts it is really a helpful tool uh the questions that come out of the exam are not similar but uh it helps to drill the fundamentals so that's like uh focus on force they have like the questions uh like the topical questions as well as the practice exams and then uh before your exam it'll be useful to buy criterion like our practice test which is 20 dollars uh i think that was yeah i just wanted to add on yeah absolutely focus on force is a great resource mike udemy mike wheeler those are all great us, you know, resources that Salesforce acknowledges and uh, endorses. So definitely go and look at all of those. Um, practice tests are really helpful. A lot of people take it um, before the exam, if they walk you through the scenarios. Um, yeah, great points. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was awesome yeah. for all the suggestions. Thank you. Good that you raised this question so a lot of people can benefit. Um, Thank you. you. Want to ask any more questions? Uh, yeah, hi all, uh, my name is Pragya mm -hmm. and I'm here from Toronto, Canada. Hey. And uh, I would like to join any groups uh, if it is. And I am certified uh, admin and looking for some volunteering work if anybody could help in that because that will be a great hands-on and give me a little bit boost and confidence to face the interview. Uh, so I'm looking for that if any help from that side. Yeah, uh, you can connect with me. Uh, so we do have a nonprofit kindcause.org. You can connect with me. Uh, we can also, I, I know that a lot of, I've, um, you know, volunteered through volunteer, uh, what do you mean? Uh, the one site for volunteers like there is there are many volunteer sites you can look those up a lot of nonprofits um they want uh, you know volunteers to help them with technology and all that so definitely look up those sites uh, also connect with me um, yeah, sure. yeah and uh, yeah, so I think you, you should be able to, you, uh, as everything else, you'll have to apply to the different and nonprofits are do look for, you know, labor who and the volunteers who can help them with technology because technology is one of the most challenging things for them. So and that's why we established kind cause so that we can help in technology, we can provide help to uh, nonprofits uh, in technology who you know, want to uh, focus all their funds in their core mission areas. Yeah, thank you, Shiba. So I can connect you in LinkedIn or like- Yes, uh, LinkedIn or... would be fine. Maybe I can stop the recording now. And we can just network. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> 